welcome to the Sea Caucus Library's retrospective on the Vietnam War at home and abroad. I'm Joe Ryan. I serve as public information officer for the city of Bayonne. I'm also an adjunct professor of political science at St. Francis College in Brooklyn. You are about to see a set of reflections by people who played various roles during the 1960s and 1970s. We're all speaking for ourselves, offering our own perspectives on life in that period. I'll be offering some opening comments about Vietnam itself and about some impacts the war had on the United States, New Jersey, and Hudson County. These opening comments will cover some highlights of the history. Due to time limitations, they will not be able to cover everything. Let's begin with Vietnam itself. Vietnam is located in Southeast Asia. The French conquered Vietnam during the 19th century. The colony was known as French Indochina. During World War I, American President Woodrow Wilson pledged our nation's support for democracy and self-determination. At the Versailles Conference in France, delegations from many nations met after World War I to redraw the map of the world. Nguyen I Quoc, a Vietnamese man living in Paris, joined a group that petitioned the world's nations for self-determination for Vietnam and an end to French colonialism in Indochina. This request was ignored. Nguyen I Quoc used as many as 200 pseudonyms in his life. He became well-known later under another name, Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh had a career as a cook, that took him to Europe and the United States. He was educated in the Soviet Union before returning to Vietnam in 1940. Back at home, Ho Chi Minh fought against the Japanese occupation of Vietnam during World War II. As the war was ending, Ho Chi Minh proclaimed the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. In 1945, the French tried to reassert their colonial control over Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh emerged as the leading nationalist in the struggle for Vietnamese independence. To counter Ho Chi Minh, France set up the state of Vietnam in the southern part of that country. Under the leadership of Emperor Bao Dai from 1946 to 1954, the French fought the first Vietnam War under Ho Chi Minh and his Viet Minh forces. The Viet Minh received support from the Soviet Union and the Chinese Communists. The French were supported by the United States. In 1954, the Viet Minh defeated the French convincingly at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. At the International Geneva Conference in 1954, the French recognized the Viet Minh as the government of Vietnam north of the 17th parallel. The United States helped transport one million anti-communist refugees to South Vietnam. There was supposed to be an election throughout Vietnam, but it never took place. The second war began in 1955. In the United States, we call this the Vietnam War. In Vietnam, they call it the American War. The U.S. government viewed the war in Vietnam as part of the global competition between communism and the supporters of freedom. Vietnamese communists viewed the war as a struggle for national self-determination against outside forces. Emperor Bao Dai was overthrown by his prime minister, Ngo Dinh Diem. Diem was assassinated in 1963 and was followed by a series of military men who held power over the next 12 years, ending with Nguyen Van Thu, the last president of South Vietnam. Communist insurgents known as the Viet Cong fought against the South Vietnamese government with the support of North Vietnam. The number of American military advisors in Vietnam increased gradually during the Kennedy administration, and then U.S. combat forces grew dramatically under the Johnson administration. There was never an American declaration of war. Instead, in 1964, a resolution in Congress, known as the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, gave President Johnson broad latitude to use American forces to defend our allies in Southeast Asia. The resolution was passed after an incident and an alleged incident in the waters off Vietnam between North Vietnamese and American vessels in the summer of 1964. The first incident took place in July. The second incident was alleged to have happened in August 1964, but it apparently never took place. Years later, North Vietnam's top military leader, General Nguyen Vo Giap, confirmed that North Vietnam did attack American vessels in July 1964. However, he said the incident alleged to have happened in August 1964 never took place. Nonetheless, the resolution led to a significant escalation of American military involvement in Vietnam. By 1968, more than half a million American troops were in Vietnam. The American public support for the war began to decline seriously in early 1968 when the communists carried out a major offensive during Tet, the Lunar New Year. 
on their TV screens. Americans were very disturbed to see that communist militants were fighting on the streets of Saigon, South Vietnam's capital. After an anti-war candidate, Senator Eugene McCarthy, finished a strong second in the New Hampshire presidential primary, President Johnson decided not to seek a second term. In November 1968, Richard Nixon was elected president. He claimed to have a secret plan to end the war. The secret plan turned out to be the gradual withdrawal of American troops. They were to be replaced by South Vietnamese soldiers in what was called the Vietnamization of the war. In January 1973, the United States concluded a peace deal with the Vietnamese. All American forces withdrew from Vietnam by May 1973. During the next two years, the fighting continued between the Vietnamese forces. Communist troops made steady gains and captured more and more of South Vietnam. North Vietnamese troops took control of Saigon on April 30, 1975. South Vietnam surrendered. The communists also took over in the neighboring countries of Laos and Cambodia. I will have more to say later about what happened next. Meanwhile, what was happening here in New Jersey during the Vietnam War? A look back at newspapers from the 1960s and 1970s reveals that the war had a variety of impacts on New Jersey. The 1964 Democratic Convention took place in Atlantic City. There were anti-war protests outside the convention on the Atlantic City boardwalk. During the following four years, President Johnson built up the number of American troops in Vietnam, and there were protests against that here in New Jersey. In 1965, at a teach-in, Rutgers University professor Eugene Genovese said he would welcome what he called the impending victory of the Viet Cong. He made this statement during the 1965 New Jersey gubernatorial election campaign. Bumper stickers appeared that said, Red Rutgers of Reds. Republican gubernatorial candidate Wayne Dumont called on Governor Richard Hughes to fire Genovese. Hughes declined to do so on the grounds of preserving academic freedom. Genovese was not fired. News stories from New Jersey newspapers in those years show pictures of New Jersey boys in uniform and describe their military medals, promotions, and assignments. A news story from 1969 discusses the Women's Club of Secaucus, which formed an assembly line to pack up nearly 50 dozen cookies for a project that sent thousands of New Jersey baked cookies to men serving in Vietnam. Women's clubs, schools, Christian parishes, Jewish organizations, and Red Cross chapters sent holiday packages to the troops for Christmas and Hanukkah. As opposition to the war increased in 1968, New Jersey students became increasingly reluctant to join the Reserve Officer Training Corps, the ROTC. ROTC enrollments in New Jersey fell from 212,400 in 1968 to just 75,000 in 1973. The Rutgers ROTC decreased in size from 1,000 members in 1968 to just 66 in 1973. By 1970, the war was losing support among some elected officials in Hudson County. Bayonne Mayor Francis Fitzpatrick asked the Selective Service System to draft no more troops from Bayonne. He claimed that on a proportional basis, more GIs from Bayonne were being killed in the war than were troops from any other city in the nation. Congressman Cornelius Gallagher said he would ask the Selective Service System to review the request carefully. Congressman Gallagher said he often had to make arrangements for the transfer of soldiers' bodies from Southeast Asia to home. There is no doubt that this is the most heartbreaking and difficult job for a congressman, Gallagher said. The congressman said he would continue to work in opposing the Vietnam War so that, quote, hopefully no other young men will have to die in a war that consumes the best of our youth, unquote. A news story from September 1970 describes an 80-mile-long anti-war march across New Jersey to Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. The march was staged mostly by veterans. The trek began in Morris and Somerset counties, then continued into Hunterdon County. At Flemington, the protesters reenacted alleged brutalities from the war. The marchers reported getting support in some areas while encountering opposition in others. That is something that the Vietnam War did. It produced a variety of opinions in America. At this time, we will hear from several people who experienced the Vietnam War in military and in civilian life. I will be back with some closing thoughts later in the film. Good morning. My name is Lee Failey, and uh, I live in Bayonne. I'm a Navy veteran. And my naval experience started on July 1st, 
1966. I enlisted in the Navy, and uh, I was uh, sent to Great Lakes Training Center, located in North uh, Chicago, Illinois. And I was there from July to September, and uh, we learned the fundamentals of being a parachute rigger. And so, as I said, I went to Lakehurst Naval Air Station. That's in uh, Manchester Township in New Jersey. And uh, two interesting notes during my experience there. Number one, I made for my first plane ride and first parachute jump, and that was in December 1966. While attending the school, I had uh, the opportunity to go to a uh, social mixer, which is uh, like a dance, at a nearby college called Georgian Court University today, and I met my future wife, Barbara, there. After graduating from the Parachute Rigger School, I was assigned to uh, Fighter Squadron VF-31, located in Oceania Naval Air Station. And that is outside of Virginia Beach, Virginia. And uh, once I graduated from there, I uh, got myself situated. One of the first things we did is we sat down and watched Super Bowl I on January 15, 1967. Green Bay Packers won that game. In April of 1967, the squadron was sent to Mayport, Florida. And uh, which is outside of uh, Jacksonville. And that was in April 1967. The squadron boarded the USS Saratoga, CDA 60, or as they commonly know, singing, singing 60 from Dixie. We left on a six month cruise to go to the Mediterranean. And uh, when you get to that area outside of the Mediterranean Sea, you have to uh, transfer command of the area from one carrier to another. And we did that outside of, outside of uh, Rota, Spain. And then once we entered our Mediterranean, we were one of two carriers that was in the area. And uh, so we were stationed on the east side for a while, and then the west side. And then uh, gradually you'd rotate so that you were in the other side part of the Mediterranean. One of the sad things that happened is during the cruise at this time is one of our final, uh, fighter pilots, actually two of the fire pilots, crashed into the Mediterranean Sea and the uh, plane exploded. And that was one of the sad points of, uh, of our time there. Also, from June 10th, June, excuse me, June 5th to June 10th, the carrier was on alert because of the Arab-Israeli war. And uh, nearly everybody on board the carrier was a little nervous about it as to whether it's going to be going to be a uh, worldwide thing or is it just going to be a uh, short battle. And fortunately, uh, they call it the Six-Day War. And after it... Uh, Everything went back to normal. But also during that time, on uh, June 8, 1967, the USS Liberty, which was a uh, naval intelligence ship, was attacked while it was in neutral waters. The uh, rumor was that uh, it was a uh, foreign ship, and uh, which was not true. It was in a neutral area. The USS Liberty did not sustain any major damage and made its way back to Naples, Italy and then got repairs there. While I was uh, with my squadron on board the ship, I was assigned to the second level of maintenance as a representative VF-31. My job was to test and repair, if required, oxygen regulators and also uh, test and fill oxygen tanks. Now, these oxygen tanks are like a big uh, basketball, and what they do is they take this gas and convert it to oxygen so the pilots can breathe. In early December, the ship's time in the Mediterranean was over. We left the Mediterranean and went uh, to the spot near Rota, Spain, 
and turned over command to another carrier, and then we went went home, back to Mayport, Florida, and Mayport, the squadron got on board a plane, and we flew back to the Oceana Naval Air Station, our home base. I went on leave at that time. Once I got back, um, we went into our routine at the Oceana Naval Air Station with the squadron, and we all sat down on January 14, 1968, and watched Super Bowl II. A few days later, on January 23rd, the USS Pueblo, a naval intelligence ship, was hijacked by North Korea. So we had another unsettling time for a while, and once that kind of settled down, we uh, continued on our, on our uh, usual routine. In April of 1968, uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. So there's a little bit of uns uncertainty of the time at that period. And then uh, on June 5th, 1968, Presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated in California after making a campaign speech. So we had another unsettling period of time there for a while. And uh, while we were at Oceana Naval Air Station, I was sent to the parachute loft as a representative of the squadron. And my job at that time was to uh, take the parachutes that the various squadrons sent in because each parachute has to be checked out on a routine scheduled time. So we take the parachute, take it out of its uh, container, look it over briefly, and then hang it in the loft, parachute loft, for a period of time. And after that period of time, we take it out and uh, repair anything that we might be needed. And then uh, we pack it up and send it back to the squadron. Also, we did the uniforms for the officers. If they had anything in their uniform that needed to be fixed, in their flight suits, or their Sometimes they're personal stuff we did a little bit, uh, but mostly it was to keep the uniform going. And then we would uh, go on to the next uh, parachute and uh, continue working on that. And of course, the ones we were in Oceana Naval Air Station, which is outside of Virginia Beach, Virginia, weekends we would go uh, to Virginia Beach, enjoy the sights, and uh, then we come back to the base. On January 12, 1962, uh, 69, excuse me, January 12, 1969, we watched Super Bowl III, where the New York Jets defeated the Baltimore Colts. One interesting highlight about that was uh, Joe Namath, the quarterback for the Jets, predicted that his uh, team would win the game. So everybody was kind of sitting on the edge of their seat, wondering if, in fact, they were going to do that. And they did, which is a surprise to everybody. A few days later, on January 20th, R President Richard M. Nixon took office from uh, President Lyndon Baines Johnson. About May of that year, the squadron started preparing for another cruise. The original plan was for the VF-31 to go to Pacific Theater and uh, for the Vietnam conflict, but in June the orders got changed. So we had to pack up all the stuff we had ready to go to the uh, Pacific, or the Seventh Fleet as they called it, and uh, so we had to pack all that stuff up in the cruise boxes and take it with us as we went back to the Mediterranean. So we went back to that area and became part of the 6th Fleet. And as we've done in the past, we were sitting off the coast of uh, Rota, Spain, and the carriers transferred their command from one carrier to the other. And then uh, we went on our, on our way. So on July 21st, 1969, a big day in American history, 
uh, Apollo 11 was uh, circling the moon, and uh, Neil Armstrong made history when he stepped down from stepped down from the uh, modular and stepped on the surface of the moon. We were watching it on TV, and uh, it was a very interesting sight, and a lot of people were uh, watching it at that time. Some of the places uh, we visited while we were over there was Barcelona, Spain, Palma, Mallorca. Palma, Mallorca, I got to uh, watch a bullfight, which I have read, read about, and uh, seen videos and read about it, and so I had an opportunity to go to one, so I went to the, went to the bullfight there. Very interesting. And uh, we are also in uh, Naples, Italy. And Naples, Italy uh, offered some tours. And one of the tours I did take was to go up to Rome, Italy, and visit the various sites there. We went to uh, the Vatican. Uh, we saw the Colosseum. And uh, also uh, one of the things that surprised me was the fact that there is a pyramid that sits in Rome, Italy. Another place that we visited on a tour was uh, Mount Vesuvius. We took a uh, bus up to a certain point, and then we could climb the stairs and actually look inside the volcano, which was kind of interesting, considering a few years ago we heard about it becoming active again. And that was kind of neat. Another place we went to was Athens, Greece. And again, we took a tour, I took a tour of the historic areas and uh, enjoyed that. We went to uh, Valenta, Malta, Istanbul, Turkey, uh, Crete. So Crete was kind of interesting. Again, we, I went on a historic tour and we saw some of the ruins there and some of the, some of the buildings were paintings left over from the, from the period and it's very popular. January 11th, 1970, the, uh, we watched the Super Bowl for so the Minnesota Vikings and the Kansas City Chiefs. The Chiefs won that game. And so we were starting to uh, get and settle back into uh, our uh, routine at Oceana Naval Air Station. And we, we, we got, the carrier arrived back in Mayport, Florida in January. And again, the squadron boarded their plane and went back to Oceana Naval Air Station in Virginia. And uh, I was assigned to the parachute loft in a short period of time. And uh, also, uh, we did uh, something kind of interesting is that the leader of the parachute loft said to us that uh, if we got our work done on a Friday, this is on a Friday, if we got our work done, scheduled work run, we could get off at noon. So needless to say, we uh, became very very happy to hear that news and worked at getting everything done. Also, that is a period of time where a plane went down off the coast of Virginia, and I found out later that the card that we have to sign after we pack a parachute and put it into a pocket went down. And then the news came around that uh, my name was on the card of those two shoots. So it's a very tense time, waiting for the findings to come through, and I uh, found, found out that uh, I was not responsible. The findings were that the plane was too low, and it did not allow the, allow the pilots of time to eject out of the planes. So we lost two pilots there from one of the squadrons. And one of the sad things was one of the pilots, this was his last flight. In a few days, he was going to be discharged from his uh, service. Also, on the weekends, we go into Virginia Beach. But at that time, my wife was, uh, my future wife was still going to Georgian Court College. So we would spend some time together going to movies, going to the beach, ice cream parlor, if we wanted to. 
And also during that month of February of 1970, I started the process of being discharged. So on February 27th, 1970, I was discharged from the United States Navy as a second class parish, uh, petty officer and uh, a parachute rigger. And uh, once I was discharged, my uh, future wife invited me back here to Bayonne, where I have been ever since to start a new chapter in my life. And we got married on uh, July 11, 1970, so this year we celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary. Also, with uh, being in this uh, city, found out that uh, we did not have a historical society, so uh, I helped form that, and I've been currently president of the Van Historical Society. Also, as president of the society, we uh, got a historic preservation ordinance set up with Mayor Hichek, and uh, I became a commissioner on it, which I still am commissioner. Something else that I'm involved with is the General Society of Mayflower Descendants, and uh, I have uh, two members of the Mayflower. Um, John Alden is my main uh, ancestor, and William Mullins. Williams Mullins' daughter, Priscilla, married John Alden in 1623. So I'm involved with the local chapter, state chapter, and and uh, I'm a publicity person there and assistant secretary. So that uh, kind of gives you an idea of what I've been up to since I've uh, joined the Navy back in 1966. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you about my service. I've been involved with the veterans community, such as the Vietnam Veterans of America and the American Legion. I am a proud Navy Vietnam veteran, having served on the board the USS Kiska and the USS Mount Baker and attained the rank of electrician's mate, second class. I, after my service, I became involved with various veterans organizations and have been active for over the last 35 years serving in many capacities, some of which I will go over with you now. With the Vietnam Veterans of America uh, in Bayonne, Chapter 151, I served as membership chairman, POW MIA chairman, Agent Orange Committee, Agent Orange Point Man Project. With the American Legion, I served in many capacities. I served as uh, chairman of Veterans in the Classroom, Americanism, chairman of both Post-19 and the Hudson County Committee, Oratorical Chairman, both again Hudson County Committee and Post-19, POW MIA Chairman, again both of Post-19 and the Hudson County Committee, and I am currently the Service Officer of Hudson County for the American Legion. Uh, I have also served as uh, Hudson County Vice Commander, Hudson County Commander, and I am currently American Legion Post-19 Commander. At the state level, I served as uh, uh, American Legion uh, State Vice Commander, uh, American Legion Project Chairman, American Legion State Commander from 19, 2014 to 2015. I am currently the Judge Advocate General. That's a mouthful, but as many, I, today I will talk to you about my responsibilities of what it means to be a veteran. My father played a pivotal role in me joining the Navy. He being a Navy corpsman during World War II, and later reservists for 33 years. It was during this time, around uh, Veterans Day and Memorial Day, that he would take my, me, and my sisters, and my mother to the Navy base here in Bayonne. Bayonne, at that time, was considered to have the largest mothball fleet in the world. It's, uh, there were World War II Korean battleships, uh, aircraft carriers, cruisers, and destroyers, and it was an awesome sight for me as a young man to see this, and it played a pivotal role standing on the battleship and looking at those huge guns and saying, wow, man, I tell you, I'd hate to be on the other side of these guns. So let me take you back some 34 years ago to 1986. I was married six years when a friend of mine, Joe Kahansky, 
a fellow veteran, said, let's go to the Vietnam Veterans of America, as he was already a member. I was thinking like when I was a kid, veterans marching in parades, hanging around veterans' posts. Well, I was in for a life-changing moment that I still remember to this day. When I got home, my wife asked me, how did it go? I told her how congressmen and state legislators came to our meetings to see what we needed. We went to Lyons Hospital to visit our hospitalized vets, opening a new vet center in Jersey City, and POW MIA recognition. But the main point of topic was always Agent Orange poisoning of our veterans. I told her I wanted to help, but I could only spend a couple of hours a week. The following year, in 1987, I asked to be appointed to the, the, uh, the Agent Orange Point Man Project. There was, uh, the VA was telling us there was little or no side effects to Agent Orange. This defoliant was developed during World War II by the United States and Great Britain and was used in Malaysia and later again in Korea and, as we know, widely used in Vietnam. We had seen the results from previous veterans and we knew we were in for a fight. With the assistance from the state of New Jersey who funded the Point Man Project, we sent blood samples from Vietnam veterans who served in areas that we knew were sprayed with Agent Orange and those from other veterans who served around other parts of the country and the world to independent labs across the United States and Europe. The results were astounding. We proved beyond a doubt that Agent Orange is a carcinogen that can and will cause cancer. Many soldiers were exposed to Agent Orange in Vietnam. Afflicted, afflicted soul of veterans brought a class action suit against the manufacturer's Agent Orange, known as Diamond Shamrock, that was right here, in, unfortunately, in New Jersey, up in Hackensack. Which, set, which was settled out of court by establishing a fund to compensate the, the veterans and their families for any disabilities. That settlement, however, covered only those who became ill by 1994. And as a result of a 2003 Supreme Court decision, veterans who became ill after 1994 can sue the herbicide manufacturers. It was during these few years we found that numerous cancers and illnesses came from Agent Orange. But the worst was that we were passing on some of these diseases to our children. And now we had to prove it to the, the VA. In 1994, New Jersey Governor Christy Todd Whitman pulled the funding for the Point Man Project due to the Supreme Court's decision of the funding for Agent Orange poisoning. The reason for the going to court in 1993 was that only 463 veterans were treated for, by the VA for Agent Orange poisoning. I hope you see where I'm going with this. Over 15 years of fighting and veterans dying from Agent Orange poisoning. It still took a couple of years later when Congress did ultimately force the VA to treat and compensate Vietnam veterans who were exposed and had effects of Agent Orange, as well as their families. It was the Vietnam Veterans of America, the American Legion, Veterans of Foreign Wars, and its disabled American veterans that forced this issue before Congress. So let's move forward between 2005 and 2010. The Brown Water Navy, those who served in the Mekong Delta in Vietnam, were already assumed to have been exposed to Agent Orange due to where they served. Agent Orange was sprayed extensively around the Delta, the Ho Chi Minh trails, and various other areas of Vietnam. By, but our naval forces who served on destroyers and cruisers, where they would support the ground troops with close naval gunfire support, close to shore, they were exposed also to Agent Orange. Another long fight with the VA and Congress ensued. The American Legion and other veteran service organizations ultimately prevailed, and we went before Congress in 2020, and the Blue Water Navy Act was passed to treat the, uh, naval veterans for Agent Orange poisoning. Of course, the VA stated they would have to research the ships involved 
but we already had the names and the hull numbers of these ships. It doesn't end there. We poisoned thousands upon thousands of, of people in Vietnam, Guam, Thailand, and Korea, which we are now paying reparations for. But it still does not end there. Agent Orange was also used right here in American soil, just to name a couple of places that we used on our airport runways and our railways. I could go on and on about the importance of veteran service organization. We as servicemen and women learned in the service, you never work alone. You work as a team of men and women trying to fight or reach a common goal. And that's what we do here in the American Legion, which we have been doing for the last 101 years and counting. As I bring you back to today, I am reminded as to what happened to just a couple of hours a week. But today I know why I started this mission so many years back. I realize that some veterans must take the responsibility to ensure that we defend our benefits and that they stay intact while knowing that the downside is not just a couple of hours a week. Being involved with the knowledge I have gained, it is now almost a full-time job without pay. But there are many, many benefits to this. I have many, many great brothers and sisters doing great work and hard work out there to help our veterans and have made many lifelong friendships. This is what it means to be a veteran. We have responsibilities to our brother and sister veterans to make sure they understand the rights and benefits they have earned, that they receive the very best care from our country, and let them know that we were always there to assist them, their families, and our deployed troops. The American Legion has many great programs to make sure this happens, from national security to Americanism, to children and youth, and to veterans' health and rehabilitation. These are the four pillars of the American Legion, with many other programs to support our veterans and their families and our troops. As you can see, the mission never ends. So today, as I record this, I want you to know that I am not here to glorify war or tell you war stories or what I did in the service or what it means to be a veteran. We veterans are a band of brothers and sisters to stand before you to let you know the American people that we put our lives on hold for you. We each signed a check made out to the American people for up to the amount and including our lives. Maybe back then we did not understand our decision or its enormity. But as we grew older, we began to understand the importance of our decision to serve our country. There's a time where we look back on the last year and look at our accomplishments and all the work still to be done and to remember those we've lost over the past year. Yes, we are the few who had the guts to wear the uniform of American Army, Navy, Marine, Air Force, or Coast Guard personnel. Why do I say guts? Because we are known as America's seventh percenters. What is a seventh percenter, you may ask? We are the seventh percent of Americans who served on active duty between World War II and the present day. And if you look at today, that is only a small percentage of the population on active duty to protect our way of freedom. Today, there are about 325 million people in the United States. About 1.3 million are on active duty. About 1.1 million are on ready reserve. About 2 million are on the retired list. And around 47,000 are active and reserve Coast Guard. Commonly, we could say that our active and ready reserve forces are about 2.5 million. That is about 0.0075%, less than 1% of the total population of our country. These young men and women volunteered to serve. No draft. They signed up of their own free will to protect our country, our freedoms, and our way of life. And believe me, they know that they are the thin line between freedom and tyranny. I can tell you knowing that less than 1% of today's population defending our country, to me this is unconscionable. If this does not strike any fear in you, I don't know what does. Yes, war is horror. Some of us thought that saw things we should never see. But our soldiers on the battlefield, at sea, and in the air understand two rules. Rule one, 
his sailors, soldiers, Marines, Air Force, and Coast Guard will die in combat. Rule two is you cannot change rule one. War is hell. War at times is intense fear. War at times is intensely boring. War is also lonely for those who spent the first year away from their loved ones. But after war and today, there are about 23.5 million veterans in the United States that still combat post-traumatic stress disorder and other issues. Some never get the proper treatment and they take their own lives because they feel there is nowhere to turn. About every 65 minutes, a veteran commits suicide. That's 22 veterans a day we're losing. This is another battle as we as veterans are fighting with the VA and Congress. But a battle we are winning. Last year, President Trump signed an executive order setting up a veteran suicide hotline, 988, much like 911 works today and will be operational hopefully within the next two years. When I served during Vietnam, it was approximately one year in country or about eight months on sea duty or, or Vietnam. Today, with so few serving in our military, our young soldiers, Marines, sailors, Air Force, and the National Guard personnel are forced to do two, three, four, and sometimes five combat tours, lasting at least six months. We as veterans know this cannot be sustained by the stress we are, stress we are putting on our military. After getting discharged, or discharged medically, many veterans still suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. While others in the VA hospital suffering from amputations, uh, traumatic brain injuries, Agent Orange, and many other issues. We as veterans, along with special therapists and combat trained counselors, try to help our veterans understand the triggers that set off post-traumatic stress disorder. Episodes and how to manage their lives with these issues. Sometimes it's flashbacks, drugs, alcohol, or financial strains that trigger a PTSD episode. It is up to America, not just the voices of our veterans, the demand from our elected officials that the VA give the highest care to our soldiers, Marines, sailors, Air Force, Coast Guard, and National Guard personnel, because we as veterans have earned it. Our fight for the rights and benefits for our veterans is a 365-day battle, but we are facing challenging issues. Most importantly, is getting our younger veterans involved with the organization such as the American Legion. Our numbers are dwindling. One veteran appearing before Congress or a state legislator will not get the job done. It is an organization such as the American Legion with 1.2 million voices that gets the job done. This is an all hands on deck initiative to make sure that our younger veterans preserve the American Legion and the other VSOs where their rights and the benefits that we fought so heartily for will surely be taken away. What I have told you today is only a snapshot of what it means to be a veteran and our responsibility as veterans to one another. I will tell you one thing. During our tours of duty, we all made unbreakable bonds, the same as we have in the American Legion, the VFW, and the other service organizations. And if you asked anyone who served or was wounded, would you do it all over again? Most would say, Hell yes, in a heartbeat. So today, as I end this interview, it is us, the few, the proud band of brothers and sisters, who stand before you and ask only one thing. A simple thank you for your service and welcome home. My name is Ed O'Connor and I'm a Vietnam veteran. I grew up in Jersey City and lived most of my adult life in Jersey City and Bayonne. My wife, uh, my wife Ellen, a Bayonne native, worked for 45 years as a Bayonne teacher and school administrator. I graduated from St. Peter's College in June 1964, at which time I was commissioned a second lieutenant in the United States Army. After college, I received a deferment to attend law school, graduating from Fordham Law School in June 1967. My active duty in the Army started in November of 1968. I received my officer training and my first assignment was to Vietnam in May of 1969. 
I was a combat intelligence officer assigned to MACV, Military Assistance Command for Vietnam, Team 96 in Vinlong Province, Cholok Province, the Vinlong Province, Cholok District, in the heart of the Mekong Delta. My assignment was different than most that you'll hear about in that I was an intelligence advisor. I was not in the traditional American unit. We lived in the Vietnamese community and worked with a Vietnamese infantry company. I was part of a six to eight man advisory team consisting of an army major who was the senior advisor, an army captain who was the executive officer, myself, the intelligence advisor, two sergeants, a radio operator, and a medic. We also had a civilian State Department employee work with our team. Our mission, <clears throat> working with our Vietnamese counterparts, was to identify, root out, and capture the Viet Cong infrastructure. The Viet Cong were from the same community. They were your farmers, fishermen, everyday workers by day who became terrorists by night. Our goal was to capture them, then re-indoctrinate them, and hopefully make them productive citizens of the government of South Vietnam. Typically, our operation was a military sweep through an area where paid agents, informers, had identified suspected activity and potential Viet Cong. Our team would accompany up to 25 Vietnamese soldiers and officers. We would be dropped off by helicopters, usually four, four Hueys and two gunships, with a fifth Huey acting as a command and control ship. Sometimes we would, we would be dropped off by uh, United States Navy patrol boats, either swift boats or PBRs, patrol boats, rivers. If suspects were captured, they were brought back to our headquarters where they were interrogated by Vietnamese personnel. The program was called the Phoenix Program, Phong Long in Vietnamese. After the war, it was investigated by Congress based on some of the extraordinary techniques used in interrogation. In my area, <clears throat> all the programs seemed to be working. We pacified the entire province in the first few months I was there, and free elections were conducted throughout the entire province. During my tour in Vietnam, I was promoted to captain from first lieutenant. I returned to the United States in May of 1970 and spent the rest of my active duty at Fort Dix being discharged on October 31st, 1970. <clears throat> what makes my service different than most is that I was able to experience a different culture, being exposed to Vietnamese people in their environment. For someone from a very parochial environment, it was an eye-opening and life-changing experiment. Fortunately for me, my transition back to civilian life was smooth. I practiced law in Jersey City for 30 plus years, during 20 of which I served as state senator for Jersey City and Bayonne, the 31st legislative district. In 2002, I was appointed a Superior Court Judge and, and served until my retirement at age 70. I now live in Manasquan, New Jersey and North Palm Beach, Florida. Thank you. After the Communist victory in Vietnam in 1975, the U.S. government transported out of Vietnam about 130,000 Vietnamese who were associated with the United States and with the former South Vietnamese government. In 1978 and 1979, another wave of people left Vietnam by boat to escape the communist government. Many Vietnamese who had been close to the former South Vietnamese government were sent by the communists to so-called re-education camps, where they were tortured and performed forced labor. The ethnic Chinese in Vietnam were endangered by tensions between Vietnam and China and by the Chinese invasion of Vietnam in 1979. 250,000 ethnic Chinese sought refuge in China. Thousands of Vietnamese and ethnic Chinese left Vietnam by boat. 350,000 people were held in refugee camps in Asia. From 1975 to 1995, an estimated 800,000 people left Vietnam by boat and arrived safely elsewhere. An estimated 200,000 to 400,000 died at sea. I remember being part of a petition campaign that asked the U.S. government to resettle Vietnamese refugees in the United States. I arranged for a pair of Vietnamese refugees to speak at Georgetown University. In the end, 
the United States accepted more than 400,000 Vietnamese refugees. France accepted more than 120,000. Australia accepted more than 108,000, while Canada resettled more than 100,000 Vietnamese. Refugees also came from other parts of Indochina. 157,000 Cambodians came to the U.S. They survived the genocidal communist Khmer Rouge government, which killed about one-fourth of the country's population from 1975 to 1979. Many of the Cambodian survivors settled in California. 147,000 Laotians came here too. The Hmong people from Laos settled in large numbers in Minnesota. Today, about 2.2 million people of Vietnamese origin reside in the United States. Many live in California, Texas, the Washington DC area, and other metropolitan areas along the East Coast. There are Vietnamese restaurants in Jersey City, Vietnamese food products such as pho soup are available in supermarkets in Hudson County. In the 1960s and 1970s, America went to Indochina. In the decades since then, Indochina has come to America. Thank you for watching this film presentation on the Vietnam War at home and abroad.